Hello everybody, uh, my name is Obed, and for my topic I chose to study the pharmacokinetics of cannabinoids and their effect on glucose metabolism in the brain. As many of you may know, uh, Oregon is a state where the recreational use of cannabis is legal. Uh, Oregon became the third state to legalize recreational cannabis in the nation on November 4th during the 2014 ballot measures. So this has opened a bunch of doors uh, for many individuals to now have safe access and perhaps try cannabis recreationally for the very first time. Some individuals, however, are hesitant because of false claims by the media that cannabis consumption will make you do all sorts of crazy stuff. As we can see, some of the claims are a little bit more exaggerated than others, um, but one of the phrases or claims that often is thrown around is that weed kills brain cells. So that's why today we're going to be briefly investigating how cannabinoids, which are closely related compounds that include the active constituents of cannabis, affect metabolism in the brain. Uh, the brain is one of the most important organs in our body, so I think that it's really important to be aware of the full effects uh, that recreational drugs have on organs such as the brain. Again, it's important to investigate how cannabinoids affect glucose metabolism in the brain because the brain is one of the most metabolically active organs. Together with the heart, liver, and kidneys, they consume about 60% of the body's energy requirements. The brain stores little energy as glycogen and relies almost entirely on circulating glucose for fuel. Without sufficient energy supply, neurons can't function efficiently. If these cannabinoids are affecting glucose metabolism in the brain, then we want to investigate how this process is occurring by first studying a little bit about the cannabinoids and what they are. Cannabis consists of two main active constituents being THC or tetrahydrocannabinol and CBD cannabidiol. These are two of the most abundant cannabinoids found in cannabis uh, with others including CBL, CBE, CBN, and a bunch of others. Here in the image we see THC and CBD on the top left you can see that all structures are very similar as they're all closely related. For this investigation, we're going to focus on the pharmacokinetics of THC as it is the most abundant cannabinoid in most cannabis. There are four primary steps to pharmacokinetics, absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion. It is important to see how the compounds of cannabis are processed by our bodies in order to fully grasp and understand how glucose metabolism can be affected by THC or any of the cannabis constituents. Absorption is the first part of pharmacokinetics and it describes how our body absorbs a certain compound. In this case, inhalation is the fastest route in absorption for THC or most cannabinoids as THC is detectable in plasma only seconds after inhalation. Oral administration uh, shows slow and erratic uh, absorption with maximal plasma concentrations usually after 60 to 120 minutes, so one to two hours. Uh, these are two of the most common routes of absorption. Sublingual is also relatively fast compared to oral administration. The distribution of these certain cannabinoids, such as THC, greatly depend on how vascularized tissue is. THC rapidly penetrates highly vascularized tissues such as in the liver, heart, fat, lungs, kidneys, and spleen, among others. Only about 1% of THC administered intravenously was found in the brain at the time of peak cycloactivity. Uh, this is likely due to the high perfusion rate of the brain moving blood in and out rapidly. This perfusion rate is important because of the readily available source of glucose coming in. Later in a couple of the studies that I use in this research, we're going to see why this perfusion rate is important. Um, and how these certain constituents in cannabis can affect that rate. The next part of pharmacokinetics is metabolism. Diving a little bit into the metabolism of two of the most abundant constituents of cannabis, THC and CBD, we can see that metabolism mainly occurs in the liver by microsomal hydroxylation and oxidation catalyzed enzymes of the cytochrome P450 complex. In humans, the carbon-11 is a major site attack, as seen at the top of the chemical structure. Hydroxylation results in 11-hydroxy-THC and further oxidation into THC 
COOH, or the acid form. Long-chain fatty acid conjugates of 11-OH-THC are proposed to be a form in which THC may be stored in tissues. The last part of pharmacokinetics is excretion. THC is excreted within days and weeks mainly as acid metabolites. Most is excreted in feces, although about a third is in urine. Major reasons for slow elimination is a slow rediffusion of THC from body fat and other tissues into the blood. Detectable metabolites can be in urine for up to 12 days or longer. This slide kind of gives a general outline as to what we have talked about so far with administration of THC being at the top, absorption through the lungs, intestine, colon, skin, and then the distribution of THC and its constituents to body tissues such as the fats, proteins, uh, the hair, and then how it gets metabolized by certain hepatic microsomal and non-microsomal processes. Now that we've seen how the body handles the consumption of cannabis, Let's see how it can affect the glucose metabolism in the brain. This is one of the studies that I used in my investigation from 1996, in which brain glucose metabolism with and without THC was evaluated in eight normal subjects and eight chronic marijuana abusers using PET imaging. What they found in this study was that there was a decreased baseline cerebellar metabolism in chronic marijuana abusers, and they also documented activation of orbital frontal cortex and basal ganglia during THC intoxication in marijuana abusers, but not in normal subjects. So recapping what they did is they took eight healthy individuals and eight abusers of marijuana, and they studied the brain glucose metabolism in each. And what they found was that in abusers, there was a decrease in cerebellar metabolism. These findings are important because they tell us that cannabis constituents do affect the rate at which glucose is processed in the brain. In this figure taken from the study, uh, we see percent change in metabolism in chronic marijuana users being the black bars and normal users being or normal subjects being the hatch bars. And what we see is that there is a greater percent change in metabolism uh, in the chronic marijuana users. So you would think this is good and that this shows an increase in the metabolic rate of glucose in the brain. However, this is not the case because this is a percent change in metabolism from a resting state. Um, so what this tells us is that our resting state, normal subjects are going to have a higher metabolic rate than do cannabis users. And so once again, this finding tells us that Cannabis constituents do in fact affect the metabolic rate of glucose in the brain, uh, which can further have some adverse effects, such as affecting uh, our neurons um, and not allowing them to function how they should be. So this was another paper that I used in my investigation. And much like the prior one, it too studied cerebral glucose metabolism in young adults with cannabis dependence. And they also looked at dopamine receptor availability. Glucose metabolism was calculated by a modification of a method uh, by Phelps and other authors in this study. Uh, and what they found was that cannabis dependent subjects demonstrated lower normalized glucose metabolism in several regions of the brain compared to healthy individuals that were not cannabis dependent. Once again, much like the prior investigation, they had the same findings that some constituents of cannabis, such as THC and CBD, do affect the metabolic rate that glucose is processed in the brain. So this is one of the figures from this study, and it shows some imaging in different parts of the brain, uh, the top being the medial orbital frontal cortex, the middle being the medial posterior parietal cortex, and the blue spots that you see are going to be the decreased metabolic activity in these different regions. Um, for glucose. And so again, it's evident that there is a an effect by these cannabis constituents um, that lowers glucose metabolism in the brain. 
In this table from the study, we can see that normalized glucose metabolism is quantified um, in different brain regions. So on the left, we're going to see all the different brain regions, such as the striatum, um, the right orbital frontal cortex, the parietal cortex. Um, the CD is going to be the cannabis-dependent individuals, while the HC are the healthy controls. And what we see is that there is a percent reduction in the glucose metabolism in all of the brain regions. Uh, the orbital frontal cortex, we see the greatest percent reduction. Um, and so from this, it's evident that glucose metabolism in the brain is decreased with the, um, the use of cannabis and the constituents found in cannabis. Compared to controls, chronic users had lower normal blood flow in the ventral prefrontal cortex, posterior cere cerebellum, and vermis bilaterally in the study. Decreased perfusion in right prefrontal, superior frontal, and central cortical areas in long-term cannabis-dependent users was also seen. Um, this is significant because, once again, the brain uses about 60% of the body's energy um, and relies heavily on glucose from flowing blood for its energy. By affecting the rate of perfusion um, and the rate at which blood goes to the, to the brain and the rate at which glucose can be used for energy readily in the brain, um, there, there is going to be unknown effects. Um, this can affect, again, neuronal uh, activity. It can affect um, things that we don't know yet. So my conclusions, um, deeper investigations are needed and further research should be done in order to fully understand any negative effects that cannabinoids can have on the human body. Um, for now, individuals should know that there are unknown risks of recreating with cannabis in excess. Um, that although minimal should be taken into consideration. Um, lastly, um, you know, is it safe? It wouldn't be legal, I guess, if it wasn't safe. Um, however, there's uh, still a lot more research and a lot more uh, studies that have to be done on, on cannabis in order to fully understand its full health risk um, when being used recreationally. Lastly, these are some of my resources. And I want to thank everybody for taking the time to listen to me.